Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with University of Illinois, coming at you from Macomb, Illinois, and we have got a great show for you today. It is a favorite one every single year we do this, and it is picking out our plants that we're going to grow this year. And you know I'm not going to do this by myself. I am joined, as always, by our co-host, horticulture educator Ken Johnson in Jacksonville. Hey, Ken. Hello, Chris. Have you got your stuff all ready to go? All ordered? It's not steal ordered. Steal our ideas this year. I, I, I'm actually going to steal your ideas this year. Um, going to have to cushion out the credit card a little bit here because uh, the list is is long. Um, and I'm excited to share this with folks today. Um, how about yourself? Do you have seed in hand? Everything is ordered. It's put into individual boxes based on when we're going to start it. Really start planting some seeds probably this weekend. Um, oh my stuff, gosh, so. so organized. My goodness, it's just incredible. Well, uh, <laughs> that, was my, that was my New Year's resolution was to be organized. So you know, That's right. That's right. Best. Well, that was my New Year's resolution, resolution too, and I haven't even ordered anything yet, so we can see how well I'm doing. Um, and, and we are also joined this week by our fellow Good Growing uh, contributor, horticulture educator, Emily Zweihart in Rock Island, Davenport. You're in the Quad Cities area. Let's say that. Yes. I am. Hi, guys. How are you? Oh, good. It's warm. It's February 7th, and um, I think I need to shave my beard off, so... That might happen too. Uh, so that it's just warm right now. It's gross. Yeah, it's very gross. Feels like mud season. I know it should be frozen season. It should be ice and snow season, but instead we're just muddy all over the place, and nothing wants to grow because it's still a little too cold. The days are a little too short. Ah, not ready for uh, not ready for more mud because it's supposed to rain and be even grosser and warmer later this week. Yeah, the maple maple sap's flowing though. So, yes, I have heard that they have tapped the trees down in Dixon Springs in southern Illinois. I think they're tapping trees up and around central Illinois in different uh, parks and such. So, it sap is flowing. Maple syrup will be had here in the next couple of months. So that'll be that'll be at least one benefit to warmer winter weather. So we tapped our trees. We have two silver maples. We tapped those last weekend and got three pints of sap off of them so and do you do you you and you're going to boil that down right you don't drink the the sap for uh irregularity in the digestive tract as i've heard people do the plan is to boil it if we if we get enough so i think we'll, now we we'll maybe get a tablespoon so we'll hopefully we end up getting some more sap and i'm not sure what the uh the ratio is for like silver maple because it doesn't Sugar maple, like 40 to one. Something yeah. Like that. So, yeah. Oh, well, you can have a silver dollar pancake with syrup mm -hmm. on it. And we will share a pancake and syrup. Yes. So. <laughs> Everybody gets the teeniest little bite. Oh, guys, we have to talk about what are we going to grow this year? Uh, I know our lists are long and varied. Um, and when it comes to this topic, Ken, you have always been the master of picking out weird stuff uh, to grow in the garden. And weird to to us equals cool. Um, and so I'm always so interested to know what you're going to grow uh, this year. Emily um, uh, is uh, here today, and she's going to talk to us about a lot of the different things she wants to grow. She's also doing a sunflower class later on this year. And so we're going to dive into sunflowers a little bit because um, I'm interested in growing a couple different types. I know, Ken, you've grown sunflowers uh, in Jacksonville as a demonstration project. And so I, I'm curious to know more about sunflowers uh, this week, too. So it's going to be a show of what are we growing? Some of the interesting things, unusual things, some of the just here's what I picked out. And then we're going to talk about sunflowers. So, uh, Ken, would you mind just kicking us off? Just just pull a plant out of the bucket here and just see, uh, and and we'll just see where we go from here. All right. So one we're going to do uh, this year that I had never heard of before is shiso. Um, S H I S O. Yes. Okay. So that was one. We're just going through garden catalogs. Saw that and wondered what is that and. We're going to try your own it. So according to 
the uh, the description here. It's native to Asia. It's a culinary herb widely used in Japanese, Thai, Korean, and Chinese fare. Beautiful leaves and flowers are both edible with a minty basil-like flavor and hints of cumin, clove, and citrus. Wow, that's wow. quite the mix of flavors. So, yeah, we will we'll see how that goes. I guess there's there's red and green kinds. Um, we got a green kind called Asian IP or Asian IP. It's an annual. Ah, so, uh, yes, I believe so. Probably figure that out before. <laughs> <laughs> what? How big does it get? Where would you put it in the garden? We're just gonna throw it somewhere and hope for the best. I don't think it gets terribly big. Eighteen to thirty inches tall, six to twelve inch spacing. So, so it's something if, if we keep it pruned back, it'll just get hopefully nice and bushy and not get too ginormous on it. Shizo, tastes like anything and everything. <laughs> I, I yeah I'd like to try this one so I will I will report back this fall mm -hmm. or maybe yeah. this summer and yeah. let everybody know how that works out at, at listeners viewers if if you are making your list like I am right now I've got my notepad right now and I'm writing down everything Emily and Ken are saying <laughs> um and we will report back to you later this year Shizo man it's like uh way to set the bar high Ken really high um <laughs> I'm going to cross out everything on my list here. I'm just going to Google uh, weird plants to grow. Yep. All right. Well, in, in, in because of that, uh, I, uh, I will say, Emily, what do you want to follow that with? <laughs> well, everybody just take a deep breath. Mine's not that crazy. Um, we grow a lot of, um, I kind of have three categories. What I am, I guess, falling into this year, not intentionally but we started ordering seeds and then they arrived and then we realized what we had done which was that we are growing a lot of pumpkins we're going to grow a lot of tomatoes and a lot of sunflowers slash cut flowers um, in the garden and so i'll start off with a pumpkin i'm excited about because it's supposed to be pink it is called porcelain doll and um you know it's a medium-sized pumpkin it, it's advertised as being edible the skin can be edible, but I think we'll use it for you know decorative purposes um, for the most part. Um, deeply ribbed uh, fruit between 16 and 24 pounds. And so kind of that medium size um, pumpkin. So we'll see how pink it is, but I have high hopes. We bought some of that seed too this year. <laughs> the porcelain doll? <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Scratch that one off your list, Ken. You can't talk about it. <laughs> Great minds. Stole one from Ken. <laughs> well, that's cool. I, so we grew Jardale last year, and that was a really fun one to grow. And I basically have written off pumpkins for this year because we grew. We had a successful pumpkin year last year, mm -hmm. which means this year we're going to have squash bugs and squash vine borer and every and every problem known to pumpkin. Um, and so, but porcelain doll. That sounds like a fun one to grow. Oh, it might make me break my rule of one growing pumpkins every three years. So do uh, what we do and just dig up more of the yard. That's right. Maybe the neighbor's yard. I'll I'll see if that the neighbor actually I have a neighbor a few doors down. I garden sit. I think I could be like, hey, grow some pumpkins. I'll give you the seed. Mm. Yeah. All right, porcelain dolls on my list. Um I, I will say my list is probably even less uh, exciting than than anything here um, because when I go through all the seed catalogs, I saw the plant in every single one, and it's a potato. Uh, it, it literally is the German butterball potato. Uh, something about that speaks to my my bloodline, my my Germanness. Which turns out I'm not. Uh, turns out I'm more Irish, but but Irish are big potato people too. So, um, I've never ordered potatoes from a seed company though. I've always just gone to a farm store and just gotten the red, yellow, or white potatoes. Um, have either of you ordered potatoes online, like a specific type? You have, Ken. Was yes. it successful? Yep. So we've done it. I don't know. Probably last four or five years, we get purple potatoes. The purple flesh potatoes and the pink flesh and blue and so we try all the different colors and hopes that the kids will actually eat them no mm -hmm. um, yeah we've had always we've had success you know they just come in the mail and pop them in the ground as is okay. 
Well, th that's my goal is to order for the first time online potatoes. Yeah, I'm going to go with German butterball potatoes and I'm excited about it. And it's not shizo, but it's it's just a potato. Has it, have either one of you grown the purple sweet potatoes? I was tempted by those. And so I could still be convinced. Purple leaved? No, there's purple, a, a actual fruit. purple flesh. Yeah. I've I've only grown guess... Beauregard and Georgia Jet, unfortunately, okay. but they're both the the mm, orangish flavored. Yeah, I so grew we, Beauregard a while ago, but and we grew some, just got some of the ornamental ones from the store last year, and they, they produce tubers. I think there there are some cultivars. I don't think Louisiana states put out for ornamental and for eating purposes. I think that's what they may have been. Um, but I don't like sweet potatoes, so my wife ate them. And... What? Oh my goodness! And also doesn't like onions. Is that right? You don't like onions. Oh, I like onions. You like onions? Uh, there must be someone else I was talking to. They don't like onions, but they grow everything under the sun. There's people that don't like tomatoes. They grow tomatoes. So go figure. It's just for the challenge of doing it. So Ken, what what? What do you have to lay on us now? Uh, are we walking down from Shizo or are we just building this tower right up to the sky here? Um, I think the only other like completely new, like never grown before, we're going to try is Cardoon, mm -hmm. which is like artichoke, unless instead of the flower bud, you're eating the stalks of it. So looks similar. Um, so that's it's technically a new plant. We were artichoke last year, so it's cousin of it. Do you so, have to do that cold exposure to get anything to develop for Cardoon? So yeah, it says for this to get a minimum of 10 days of 45 to 50 degree temperatures to induce budding. Um, so I wouldn't think, and I could be wrong, so if somebody's grown this before, correct me in the notes or in the comments. But I think if you want flowers, yes, you need it. <clears throat> but I wouldn't think, I think if you're just doing the the stalks, you may not. But we'll see. Maybe we'll give we'll some cold. Out. We'll give some cold. We'll, we'll not give some not cold. Mm -hmm. Let's see what happens. If we get cold, you might have to put it in the refrigerator this year, Ken. So yeah, that is a possibility. <laughs> Oh goodness, Emily! Uh, what what uh, else? Uh, do you have any other edible vegetable crops uh, you're planning on growing? Well, I do. So I'm gonna tell you a little secret. This is just between the three of us, right? This is no one's listening. Cool. So I made a mistake when I was ordering seeds. I misread the description. So I ordered um, an heirloom tomato collection. I've actually never grown heirloom tomatoes. Um, I just haven't been more focused on like the production of um, like paste tomatoes is, is primarily what we do. I thought, nope, this year I'm gonna, gonna try something new. And so this was a collection. And the way I read it was that it was a collection of 40 different um, types, which seems amazing. Like I said, like buy now. <laughs> that's, not what, that's not what they were selling. They were selling four different types with 40 seeds in each packet. So I went from expecting 40 plants to having, what is that, 120? So mm -hmm. I am really gonna be growing, <laughs> Ken's <laughs> laughing at me. I'm really gonna be growing some um, heirloom tomatoes, but they are uh, just brandywine, striped German, Cherokee purple, and Amish paste. And so um, gonna need to find some room for them and maybe share with some neighbors those plants. Yeah. But uh, I'll start those seeds early and, and see what we get. Can't go wrong with those four types. So those are, I, mean, I think they're excellent. I have grown heirlooms and um, also indeterminate tomatoes for years. And Ken keeps saying, Chris, you need to start growing some determinate tomato hybrids. And I'm like, no, Ken, I like having an unruly uh, ramshackle garden um, <laughs> and fighting to keep the plants upright. So no, I, it, I, I'm pretty, I, pretty sure, and you guys correct me if I'm wrong. Those heirloom types are indeterminate, so trellising can be a lot of work for some, in in some cases. Um, do you have a plan for this year, Emily? Um, I mean, I have some intentions. I always mm -hmm. have the intentions, right? Um, I think actually this year, what 
I used to do. So I have some pretty sturdy tomato cages that have worked pretty well for us in the past, but I think this year I'm actually just gonna use some hog panels and um, kind of let them grow lengthwise within the, the garden. Um, it's gonna become unruly, I'm just sure of it. And that's okay, but um, yeah, I think that that'll allow a little better access, a little better airflow if I kind of spread them out that way. So we'll see. I did order, I did, um, we've, like I said, we've always grown like kind of like paste tomatoes and those are indeterminate um, for the most part. Well, we've grown, which are crazy in the garden, but I'm gonna be growing some mountain merit. Those are um, determinant slicers. And so I'm gonna take Ken's advice and try yes. those. Um, I've not had those before, but um, we're also going to grow those. I'm growing them also for our master gardeners in our demonstration gardens, because those um, hopefully will will look better <laughs> instead of being so wild out in those community gardens. But um, looking forward to that. Have you had mountain merit at all? Is that a, no? Okay. I'll report back. I'm sure they're delicious. I haven't met a tomato I don't like, so. Except for grocery store tomatoes. Oh, those, um, is that even a tomato? <laughs> no, it's just cardboard spray painted red. <laughs> I I don't have, um, I have not picked out tomatoes for this year. It's going to be a determinant, probably not going to be many. I didn't grow many tomatoes last year either. And I was happy with that. Um, I was happy with what I got. I was happy with the space that I dedicated to it. And then I had a, a whole row of volunteer cherry tomatoes that really just satisfied any need that we, we had um, for the late part of the summer. So, but I have picked out one weird cucumber. Uh, this is one that we saw uh, growing. Uh, we, uh, Master Gardeners, McDonough County ones, we visited historic Nauvoo uh, and the horticulturist there, Richard Hancock, he showed us this and it's called the Sikkim cucumber, S-I-K-K-I-M. And it, it does not look like a cucumber. I saw it. And I'm like, is this a melon? Like, what? What is this? It has this this um, brownish cream colored uh, uh, kind of model modeling effect to it. And but it's a cucumber. And he says it tastes good. It's it's really popular. And so I'm going to try growing the Sikkim cucumber. And I will hopefully have some fun interesting pictures of my children uh not wanting to eat them because <laughs> they're like what is this weird rock that you're trying to feed us i just looked at a picture of it that does look unusual mm -hmm. say. That's, we grew lemon cucumbers last year and those are like round they're about like baseball softball size and yellow you know, like, and they kind of have a more mild flavor. Um, but that is, that is really intriguing there. Yeah. It, it's weird looking <laughs> and I want to, I want to grow it. Mm -hmm. And, and I mean, uh, otherwise for us in the vegetable garden, we're, we're going to grow things that we like to eat. And the one thing that we do eat a lot of is like zucchini and summer squash, especially in, in the summer months, we like to do stir fries and stuff. So I know we're I, we're going to do some summer squash, probably not zucchini. Um, we'll just go down to the neighbor because they grow like three plants, and that's enough for everybody, two families. So, um, but but yeah, I don't know. Ken, what's next on your list? So we added we're doing well. We, we're doing parsnip this year. That's one we haven't done in the past. So I still have it in the ground. It's that's a good to one to grow. For, for how many years now? We're finally going to grow it. So. Yes, I, and and it's also a larval host for is it the black swallowtail, and I let I let them defoliate the foliage, and they come right back. They they don't seem to mind as long as they're good, established, and well watered. Figured you'd like that. So yeah, well, we're gonna try that one. Um, I'm trying to think, then we're gonna grow. I think we've got six or seven different types of lettuce we're gonna try. Um, some because they look cool, some because they have cool names. Uh, so we got red iceberg, so it's like the name implies a red iceberg mm -hmm. lettuce. Um, black hawk. So that one is a really dark maroon um, lettuce, like in pictures it does almost look black. Um, <clears throat> so we've got that. Uh, red sails, which is a loose leaf. Black hawk is too. Uh, again, that's got red leaves on it. Uh, Continuity, uh, which is a butter type uh, lettuce, uh, it's also red. Devil's tongue, because it's got a cool name. 
uh, got reddish purplish leaves at the tips and then green at the base deer tongue because it's a cool name it's just green mm -hmm. uh, and then the drunken woman lettuce yes so i i got it right behind me the seed packet so <laughs> yeah yeah so th those are fun exciting uh different types of lettuces now are you going to do it all at once you're going to succession sow those to have them throughout spring maybe summer so yeah, we usually try to succession so probably do a couple plantings in the spring and we'll hold some seed uh, to plant again late summer for the fall this is the plan anyway it's always the plan and you'll do a little bit of each with each succession planting so you have a mix nice yep. hopefully we can keep them all straight and find enough sticks in the garden to see what's going on. So, Emily, do you have uh, any more additions uh, to the vegetable garden patch? Um, a few. Um, it's not technically a vegetable. Um, I'm going to try to grow some chamomile. I uh, honestly don't know if I even like chamomile, like tea or anything, but mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we'll find out. Um, but you, you would consume the flower, and I think that that is appealing. Um, this is a different uh type of the plant that you would consume if you don't eat the flowers very often um and so i'm going to go ahead and grow some of that um uh burgundy broccoli i'm actually gonna uh I, we grow a lot of broccoli a lot of just standard green broccoli we, we freeze it and um enjoy that throughout the year and i just love love broccoli so i'm going to grow some of the burgundy um this year and see if i can freak the kids out uh mm. with that and uh, celery, I guess. This is, again, not like that unusual, but it's something that I have never grown before. And um, I think you guys actually talked about growing celery in an earlier podcast. And uh, I thought I should do that because we really like we really like celery. So we're going to give it a shot. Which celery are you doing? Uh, Kelvin. Standard we, one, it seemed like. You talk about the pink, uh, Chinese pink celery. So, I don't know if I've discovered that. So it's, we're going to try growing the Chinese pink this year. Last year we grew a, grew a purple type. I don't remember what that was called. But that was the one we grew last year. The purple one was a very strong uh, celery taste. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it was it was difficult to eat. <laughs> <laughs> Could you cook with it? Like put it. I, I would say it'd probably be better. Yeah. We didn't cook okay. with it, but I just went out weeding and stuff i grab a piece and eat it and at times it was hard to get down <laughs> mm -hmm. okay that's All good right. to know yeah i have the chinese pink celery we're gonna start this year too so i'll let you know and and as i mentioned in that podcast i don't like celery so <laughs> we'll see how it goes <laughs> well i need to get this now because i love all things pink and if mm -hmm. you know the cool kids are doing it i, I mean, think i'll have to join it's kind of pink and kind of not pink. So the I think it varies maybe a little bit depending on growing conditions and light that based on what I've seen and read about it, but it does have pinkish stems. Okay. Thanks for tempering my expectations. <laughs> yes. I'm like, now before you're really into the color pink, just know it's I'm not all, all the way. <laughs> this isn't bright pink at all. If you, if you squint, it's pink. Got it. Rose colored glasses. I'll wear my rose colored glasses. There you go. Yep. There you go. Um, I'd say the kind of the last addition that I have for the vegetable garden. Uh, we we don't have much room in my yard, uh, and but I really do love growing peppers. Uh, I do have a specific type of pepper that I like, and if it's a green bell pepper, it is disgusting. It is the most. It's like why would you eat green peppers? It just tastes like grass. Um, it's just roughage. There's no flavor. Um, and anyway, I like a ripe pepper. Uh, and I know you're supposed to harvest some uh, bell peppers when they're green. I wouldn't. I would just wait until it turns whatever color it's supposed to turn. Um, but we are going to be growing some poblanos, which typically you would harvest green. But last year we did grow trident and we waited until they were turned red. And I thought it was still really flavorful. So the poblanos has a little bit of sweetness, a little bit of heat, um, but not a terrible amount of heat. And uh, we made chili rellenos out of those. Um, and you know, when you stuff cheese inside of something and you fry it, it 
still tastes pretty good no matter what. <laughs> um, but I did look up, we're going to keep growing the Trident this year, uh, but Michigan State University did a study on poblanos and one of their top performing poblano plus top tasting poblano was named Capitan uh, or Captain. Um, and, and so we're going to order that and, and plant that this year uh, along with our Trident. Um, so we're looking forward to that. And then we're probably, I would say sweet bell peppers. We eat a lot of those in my house and we do like those little snacker bell peppers, uh, different seed companies. They have different names. There's snackers, there's uh, bite size, lunchbox, um, you know, uh, you know, snack size, you know, there's different copyrighted or patented names of these small pep sweet peppers and we'll probably order one of those so, but then in terms of that other than you know peppers and uh harvesting some of the cool greens that we're going to plant too like kale i don't have much else going into the edible side of the yard uh ken how i, I know you have a huge list here and we might need to run through these uh lightning speed <laughs> but what, what else do you got to lay on us i think the so we're drying a couple different types of radish we haven't done before. Uh, onions we're going to do from, usually we did the, the sets. We're going to do all that, all from seed this year. We tried last year and it was cool. pretty successful. So we mm -hmm. um, got some broccoli, artichokes again, um, some beets, some beans. Uh, I think really the only other big thing is going to be corn. Um, so we're going to do um, hooker sweet Indian corn. Uh, so this is a, a kind of a purple one. You can harvest it and eat it as a sweet corn or let it fully mature and then and grind it to make a cornmeal. Um, we grew it last year. We were going to do a cornmeal and I got my stuff mixed up and picked it all as sweet corn. Uh, it tastes so good, but we didn't get to try it as cornmeal. So this year I will make sure I do not pick it too early. Um, and then we're going to do uh, Painted Mountain, um, which is a Indian ornamental corn. Uh, and then Painted Hill Sweet Corn, um, which is another, it's a sweet corn. From what I've read, it, it's not the greatest sweet corn compared to the more modern varieties. It's kind of more old-timey, um, but it will also mature uh, into multicolored uh, kernels. And then the other corn we're going to do um, is uh, Silver Queen. Now, that's an older mm -hmm. sweet corn, but that is good if you want corn smut. So I'm just growing it, so hopefully it gets infected with corn smut. Do you so eat the smut then? A few years we've gotten it. Yeah, I, I so we got a little bit last year, and I, I grabbed it, stuck it in the freezer. I'll take it out and see if I can infect my corn with it, and go from there. You're braver than I am. I, I've heard it's a delicacy, but we got enough to make like two quesadillas put in there. Mm -hmm. The the lahoche. Is it good? Like, is it mushroomy, like tasting? Yeah. So we didn't we didn't have a whole lot, but yeah, there's a a hint of it. I'm sure, if, obviously, if you had if we had more of it, there'd probably be more of the taste to it. So that's that's the hope this year is that you get infected and may make sure set the sprinkler out on those things and just <laughs> make sure it's nice and wet and perfect for mm -hmm. um, them getting infected. Well. <laughs> We'll see. Good luck. Yeah. That, I mean, that's <laughs> fingers crossed. You get your corn gets infected uh, mm -hmm. with corn smut. With the fun guts. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> if, and if I see any corn infected with corn smut uh, here, I'm just going to stop the car and pick it off and I'll run it over. <laughs> yeah. So it was a couple of years ago. It was everywhere. Even in my yeah. field corn, I was seeing it. And usually that stuff's um, resistant to it. Mm hmm. I've seen it on field corn several times. And so I, now I'm just going to start picking it off and making quesadillas out of it. Just make sure you pick it before it opens up and gets all powdery. Oh, well, what happens then? You can't eat it? It's We can eat it. I don't know if it's going to taste any good, though. Ah, that's <laughs> always the best response. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Everything's edible. It's not always survivable. <laughs> we should get shirts with that on it. That's right. It's our good growing motto. <laughs> Everything's edible once. <laughs> Not only <always> survivable. <laughs> oh, well, I am sure I can eat the, the last um, 
edible crop that I'm, I'm intending on growing, which are more tomatoes. But mm -hmm. these are like artisan tomatoes. So um, kind of like a mix of different cherry uh, cultivars. And so I'm going to grow blush, which is like an elongated orangish red. It looks like there's, um, you know, some some like an ombre kind of a <laughs> coloring mm -hmm. pattern. Um, honestly, I bought them because they were on sale. So let's see what happens uh, with those. <laughs> And then a uh, gold nugget and then an indigo cherry drops. I'm particularly excited about those. Those are um, more your traditional like brown cherries, but um, the gold nuggets are bright yellow in color. And then um, the indigo cherry drops are dark purple color. So I'm excited to see how those grow and then also how they taste. So. That sounds cool. There's so much interesting color happening with tomatoes. The bicolor tomatoes are some of my favorites seeing the multiple colors on them. So I'm, yes, take lots of pictures and taste I, testing. Oh, I will. Well, and it's interesting. So my kids don't like tomatoes and I, I will eat them in the garden like you eat your celery can. I just will pop, you know, as I'm going through. <laughs> but um, I didn't grow up liking tomatoes, but I kept trying them because they were so attractive. They're so pretty, like all mm -hmm. the different colors. And they just have, you know, usually have like a nice clean you know, flesh to them. And they look like they should be, really yummy and turns out as you age and you eat and eat and eat and eat them they become yummy <laughs> they do An acquired taste it is it is <laughs> like brussels sprouts who would have thought i'd have loved that thing as an adult i know they're so good they are well i i do have a couple more items that we are going to be growing this year a few things that we have to select and these are more ornamental in nature um We'll get the sunflowers here in a second, but I need to get both of your opinions um, because we cut down a green ash tree last year and we got a big spot to fill. So I have to plant a tree this year. So I get to pick out a tree, which is really exciting because I've never lived in a spot that has a spot for a tree, like a that's going to grow into a full size shade tree. So I have narrowed my list down. Um, and I am happy to take suggestions. Now, I'm not going to do an oak because we have two big old pin oaks. Not a big fan of pin oaks, but I, I, they're, they're oaks and I deal with the acorns a lot. Um, I do like oaks, but because I already have two massive pin oaks, no more. Um, no maples. I have had it up to my eyeballs with maples. Um, if you call me with the maple problem, I'll tell you just to cut it down. Um, <laughs> That's not true. I'll try to help you. But uh, I have narrowed it down to, to three trees and also taking suggestions. But this space, I think, would lend itself really well to a Nissa sylvatica or a black gum tree. Um, it's known for a really good fall color. Uh, it is native to more southern parts of the state with uh, more wet conditions in terms of the soil, but is more tolerant of drier upland soils, urban areas. Um, this would be a tree in front of the house and so it needs to be a good performer um, the other trees we picked out also are kentucky coffee tree which i think is a beautiful tree I'm a little leery about its cold hardiness in some cases um, but they are doing more breeding for more northern tolerant like it's i think it'll be okay in central illinois as we get closer to northern illinois wisconsin it might be a more of an issue um, so kentucky coffee tree and then finally plain old hackberry. I love hackberries. The bark is cool. They get the nipple gall on the leaves. And I think that just looks neat. And they're tough trees. Uh, one problem I've noticed with hackberry over the years is that it's susceptible to certain herbicide damage more so than other trees. So considering my neighbors do spray quite a bit, that uh, might be something that would rule that one out. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Uh, Ken and Emily, do you have any thoughts or additions to my tree list. Ken, you want to go first or thinking? I'm thinking, go for it. Okay. So <laughs> whenever I'm asked this question, I like to quickly like jot down what first comes to mind because I don't like to be persuaded. And there's just so many good trees um, that we have at our, you know, um, are available in Illinois. The first two I wrote down, and I'm not making this up, are Nissa sylvatica mm -hmm. or black gum or Kentucky coffee tree. The, hey. <laughs> the third one I wrote down was tulip tree or tulip poplar. 
That's a good uh, one. I do like that one. I should add that to the list. Yeah, yeah. But I also have a love affair with hackberries. So I support any or all of those uh, mm -hmm. trees. I, th I think being in front of the house, um, I guess if you're looking for a definitive answer, I probably would go with, with Nissa. I actually put one in front of our house. Um, I put the tulip trees off to the side at our place. Um, and honestly, I don't have a Kentucky coffee tree. And now I, I'm feeling compelled to get one. But uh, mm -hmm. I don't think you can go wrong with any of those. I have seen, I'm a little farther north than you. I've seen Kentucky coffee trees do do pretty well up this way. So I, I would not, um, you know, whenever you plant a tree and, and you, we have the climate that we do now. Yeah. Anything yeah. could happen, but I, I would feel safe doing it. I'll plant one up here a little bit further mm -hmm. north than you. Sounds good. So you're wanting a large shade tree then? Yes, large shade tree. <clears throat> I did think about the um, hop hornbeam, uh, which is a bit smaller, and it's just kind of a neat neat tree, uh, but it's smaller. But I figured we might need something a bit taller, and this is a little bit shorter than some of the other ones that we mentioned, but I still just like the, the fall color performance of that. Um, and maybe just showing to other people in the neighborhood, you don't need a red maple to have good red fall color. Yes. And the branch structure is really neat on that one, too. I try to think of these trees in the winter. Um, you know, your um, the branching like it's, it's kind of like a horizontal structure mm -hmm. um, with the Nissa. Um, Kentucky coffee tree has that really open canopy. Yeah. Like, I just love that. It just looks like skeletal because it's got such big leaves. It doesn't have like the interior. Um, you know, smaller branches and twigs in there that are going to support, you know, like a maple, they have a lot of leaves, whereas the Kentucky coffee tree just has those really big giant ones that take up the canopy. Mm -hmm. um, but then hackberry, you can't really beat their, the texture of the, the bark. So yeah, tough decisions. I it's know really I'm decision. not, plant them all, find a place to plant them all. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Does Catalpa survive that far north? We've got them in Jacksonville. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Mm hmm I've seen it. I haven't seen it look overly ornamental. Um, it, as it ages, it gets kind of free forming, um, which is lovely. I love Catalpa. We've got some in our windbreak ish area like across the, the pasture. Um, but they, I, I guess I would not probably put that in my front yard. It's more of a backyard tree, in my opinion, but they're really amazing. As a younger tree, they have a very pure, strongly pyramidal shape, but mm -hmm. then as Emily mentioned, they grow more irregular. The thing that I like about Catalpa, and maybe this is why you mentioned it, Ken, is that they are one of the few shade trees that are insect pollinated. So they do provide a pollen nectar source for insects. Um, they have a beautiful flower, it smells good. Uh, so that would be another, another really good uh, attribute to this tree that it has a spring bloom that has a fragrance and smells mm -hmm. delicious and yeah. ginormous seed pods yeah yes big seed pods and my kids have learned how to make slingshots <laughs> and that's why Kentucky coffee tree is kind of also a uh, contender here because that's good slingshot uh ammo nice those like persist in the winter too you know like I I keep mentioning the winter both because we're in it and because I think that's one of the seasons we don't all fully consider when we're planting trees but those seed pods will hang on the trees and it looks i think it's a pretty ornamental element to contalpa mm -hmm. so i don't know chris you'll have to report back what you do i will and we should just have another podcast <laughs> podcast podcast episode where we just talk about trees um and that would be fun to do because i feel like we're just scratching the surface with oh, uh man. just these couple trees that we've mentioned so there's if you change your mind and you want a, a crimson king maple, we'll <laughs> dig one and deliver it to you and plant it for you. Okay. I and then I will spray it with a glyphosate. I, I, was, yeah, <laughs> I will be so unhappy about that. <laughs> it actually, so there is a crimson king maple right next to this spot. And this I know this maple has verticillium wilt. There's big chunks dying out of the canopy. Uh I probably mentioned this already on the show. My wife says, do not cut down the green ash and the maple at the same time. I'm like, but they, it, the maple should go. Um, but there is a Crimson King maple right there. <laughs> Mine's gonna get a pruning cut at ground level here. There you go. It will, ha it will happen later. eventually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think they're ugly. They're very That's ugly. That's just me. It's not just you, it's everyone. 
on this have, podcast. Yeah, we have one in our front yard too. We inherited, and it is it is declining. And um, I secretly had hoped that that derecho that we had a couple of years ago did uh, fatal damage to it. It didn't. So we're just waiting, but um, it gave me the opportunity to plant some trees around it. So when we do lose it, it's not as big of a loss. That's where I've got the tulip trees coming up, which are a little, they're quicker growing. So it'll hopefully be able to replace some of that shade quickly. But, oh, if we could go back and talk to folks in yesteryear about that Crimson King. Well, that was a lot of great information on some of the new vegetable plants that we are going to try in our gardens this year, plus the random tree that I just threw in there at the end. Um, but we gabbed on so long about those new uh, vegetable crops uh, that we did not get to some of the other ones we want to talk about, like our flowering ornamentals, our sunflowers. So that is going to be coming in part two uh, as at a later date. Uh, so look forward to part two where uh, Ken, Emily, and myself sit down and talk about the new flowering plants and ornamentals that we are going to be incorporating into our yards this year. Well, the Good Growing Podcast is a production of University of Illinois Extension and edited this week by Ken Johnson slash maybe me. Um, it is a crazy time, folks. Uh, we're traveling around doing all kinds of talks and such. So whoever gets to it first uh, at this point is what we're going with. Uh, but uh, uh, thank you very much, Emily, uh, for being here and Ken for being here uh, and, and sharing what is going to be going into your yards this year. Oh, it was a pleasure. I look forward to uh, reporting back and hearing how everybody, how we are uh, successful with our growing Yes, thank you, Emily, for being on. Thanks, Chris. And now I just got to figure out how I'm going to fit all of this into our garden somehow. <laughs> exactly. Uh, are we going to be drawing any landscape plans? Probably not. We're just going to be throwing them in the ground where, <laughs> where they land. And uh, well, I guess we are doing this again next week, so... Oh, we are doing this again next week. Uh, probably going to be part two of what are we growing in 2023? We do also have a garden bike coming up. Uh, and so we got a, a jam packed schedule uh, this year, folks. And so we're really excited. 2023 is it's getting off the ground here. And though it's early February, there's a lot, a lot of ground to cover. And so we're excited to take part in another growing season with you all. Well, listeners, thank you for doing what you do best, and that is listening, or if you're watching this on YouTube, watching, and as always, keep on growing.